Hey folks, uh, we are back here and that might be the longest technical difficulty session. We truly ap apologize for that. Uh, we have Bankstarver on with us now and Banks should be able to speak in a few minutes once they get their audio set up. Uh, and again, many apologies for that. These sessions will be recorded uh, so that you can still access them on our website at blackpublicmedia.org. Uh, so if you go to blackpublicmedia.org slash mbpc-360, uh, you should be able to access them at a later date. Uh, and Banks, if you could go ahead and turn your mic on, we should be able uh, to hear you shortly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's all right. Okay. All right. Um, I, I, I'm sorry on my end for the whatever I did to contribute to the technical problems as well. No worries, guys. We were just saying uh, Banks is joining us from Left Right Media. Uh, they're the producers of the Showtime version of the This American Life uh, series and lots of other commercial as well as public media ventures. Uh, Banks will talk to us today about the production infrastructure that you really need when you start to be a producer who produces uh, serial content. So without wasting any more of anyone's time is on banks to go into it and feel free to ask your questions in the chat window on the lower right hand portion of the screen great um, well thanks again for including me in this event and I for the last time apologize that it took so long to get on um, I am uh, happy to do this and I, I wanted to say up front when I first started speaking uh, speaking about this project that my company may be a little bit different in that we do um, work that appears on PBS, um, we do the television documentary work that's really high-end and beautiful and smart that would appear on PBS um, were it not already commissioned by another network, um, but we also, unlike companies that do exclusively that kind of work, we make programs for commercial television. And I thought it might be helpful to give you a brief glimpse of my background and uh, maybe it helps you better understand uh, who we are and what we do, how, what our approach is to television. Um, in my previous life, I was a civil rights lawyer, um, so I was uh, actively involved in lots of social issues. I was a history major in college. Uh, when I finally was brave enough to walk away from practicing law, I went back to school at a documentary program at Stanford University, and that program, uh, I'm seeing a note that we lost audio. Is that possible? Hello? I still hear Hello. you. It might be a bandwidth okay. issue. Okay. Um, and... Uh, when I went to film school, I thought I would make films about the civil rights issues I dealt with as a lawyer and that I would likely be on track to uh, work inside the world of PBS in some shape or form or possibly in the world of independent, theatrically released documentaries. Um, and while I was in film school, I ended up uh, I don't think it's fully led me the the full explanation as to how I ended up where I ended up, but I made a film about a rock band that I loved, and that band, that film was a great experience for me, and it was I had no idea what I was doing, uh, of course, but I I loved the band so much, and I was so passionate about the project, and I um, ended up. Uh, with that film, it, I landed at MTV of all places, and uh, they thought I'd be there for three months, but ended up staying for about seven years. And inside of MTV, I was sort of weirdly almost known as the PBS guy who happened to end up at MTV. So I never worked on much of the pop culture 
stuff uh, reporting. I was in the documentary group and I was often paired with a reporter or a producer who wanted to do a little more, almost more old-fashioned documentary work and uh, so we did long-form stories and after a year of doing that kind of work with the reporter I really fell in love with a more verite approach to storytelling uh, which had always been a real passion of mine and I started to make these pieces where I would go out in the world uh, representing MTV and I would take a small camera and I would shoot hundreds of hours of footage I would sometimes edit that material myself and I started telling these stories about people, uh, about things that were happening in present tense. And um, when those programs started to do well, that led to this opportunity when I was at MTV to create and develop and produce the series uh, True Life, which is still occasionally on the air at MTV. And that, prim that idea, that concept is to find three young people who are engaged in something really interesting that is sort of the same thing or they're connected and um, to follow them uh, over a period of time and to um, find to find a way to tell their stories and do it through the scene work, through the, through the verite work. And that show was really a great experience for me because I was able to hire a lot of friends and I was able to teach the younger people at MTV how to uh, shoot for documentary films and to uh, there was an amazing collection of smart young people at MTV and we created sort of a plan or uh, a structure for casting shows and um, I realized somewhere along the way that though I thought I'd be there for three months I sort of ended up staying for six years for a good reason and that was that I think I found this weird place where I was operating inside the world of commercial television but I was trying to do stuff that was smarter and I would get money from foundations and some of my films that would air as part of True Life or as a standalone special I would get foundation money to cut a longer version of the film that could then play in festivals so it was a really uh, fun period of time for me and when I left to start my own company the plan was to at least uh, experiment with the notion of of taking the commercial approach, living inside the commercial world, but doing stuff, doing work that I was really, that I had traditionally only associated with PBS or the independent documentary feature in that it was smart and cinematic and dramatic and honest and authentic, but try to do that kind of work rather than stepping fully into the world of PBS, um, maybe take advantage of my experience at MTV and do it in a more commercial approach. So my partner and I founded this company about eight or nine years ago and we had that as sort of our number one goal that we would do commercial work and we would do um, old-fashioned documentary journalism and our agents uh, call that mass and, mass and class and uh, it's uh, it's been a good approach for us. I, I I think we both thought that after a number of years in business we might have to make a decision between you know just let go of the commercial stuff and focus only in the, the more traditional PBS world or uh, vice versa and we've never really had to do that and I think it's a good time in TV to look at commercial television opportunities as not necessarily meaning that you have to do the lowest of the low form of reality TV and I want to be upfront we've done some reality TV we do some very simple real estate shows for HGTV the loudest show we've ever made is a program called Mob Wives and the Weinstein Company and another uh, significant television production company found these women and brought them to us because they wanted a more traditional old-fashioned documentary approach to the telling of those stories and we tried to do that um, and so unlike perhaps some of the other people you're listening to, um, I think I, I want to be real straight up that we do, we do two or three frontline films a year. Sometimes we, uh, as part of the magazine series, sometimes feature films, we did one recently that was housed in our office, started by a producer on his own, and then he joined us and we made this film together about, uh, 
killing, the killing of a woman in St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, her boyfriend said it was suicide, but the boyfriend was a police officer, and it raised some really fascinating questions about how police officers, in cases of domestic violence involving their own people, um, can oftentimes work to obscure the truth, um, would be safe to say. Um, so we do work like that, but I'm probably, that, that work and the This American Life series that was spoke of are jobs, or it's a workflow and a structure that I know a lot about, and uh, um, I think I might be, even This American Life is a different kind of thing because that was not a PBS program that ended up on Showtime, and Showtime uh, was wonderful and that they didn't give us a lot of notes and they wanted that show to be what Ira Glass wanted it to be and so we were able to pull that off with him and it was really exciting and fun. Much of the the more of the work that we do is finding spaces in commercial TV at networks like the History Channel or H2 which is a new sister channel or A&E or Discovery or National Geographic to do programs that have to satisfy a commercial need um, but they're smarter and uh, more, you know, consistent with what drew us to filmmaking and storytelling in the first place. So that's a world I know really well. I have friends all the time who are documentary filmmakers who want to talk to me about, you know, would we be interested in producing a film they want to make? And I think my usual answer is if you think that film has a chance of getting funded by HBO, though we have done some work with HBO, you should just go talk to them on your own. And um, they still are a place where if they get behind something, it's super exciting. If you think the idea has potential uh, to be funded by a television network, a more mainstream network, if you will, like A&E or History Channel, then we're the perfect place to um, explore that um, possibility and we have great connections there that we work with those people all the time um, sometimes we're also drawn in when somebody has an idea for a feature film a feature doc and a network sees the possibility of that feature doc being serialized and turned into a television series and they will come to us and pair us with the filmmaker and um, we did a project for Planet Green, uh, which a network that no longer exists by that name, but it was about the was a, an area of North Dakota that had been a virtual ghost town until a huge oil and gas reserve was discovered in the area. And we were able to work with the two documentary filmmakers who had never done serialized TV before and turned it into a six-part series. And we're working on something now. There's a really fun film that you can see on iTunes called Psalm that is about the world of the master sommeliers and the hardest exam in the world, um, the one they have to pass to become a master sommelier. And the film is really lovely. And a network introduced us to the filmmakers and we've made a pilot or presentation for a network and we'll see if they pick it up and, and turn it into a TV series. So that's the world I know incredibly well. and. Um, Again, it may not fit exactly what you guys are interested in doing, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about that world and how it operates. I, I know that when I was first talking to MBPC about this, the, the note was talk about infrastructure and sort of how you put together the tools of the trade and what you need to, to work and operate in your world. And I'd say over the years that we started with very little. We didn't um, invest money. Per se, we um, were able to sell a TV series uh, pretty early in the process, and we made sure that we kept our costs way down until we got that sale. And then we used that first project to essentially fund the buying of the gear we needed to make that show. And we were, with that com show commitment, we were able to get a bank loan that helped us sort of deal with some cash flow stuff. And uh, after that, we just very... Uh, deliberately move slowly and gosh eight or nine years later we're in a much bigger space than I ever thought we would be in and we have you know 35 edit bays and we're we're really full at the seams um, but it's uh, it's just been a very 
step-by-step -step process uh, is what I'd say. I, the big pitch that I make always for people who want to break into my world and do what we do, and again, I'm not assuming that all of you want to do that, is that it's for me at least it's less about and again this speaks more to the commercial TV path it's less about getting infrastructure because even if you have the world's greatest idea for a TV show that National Geographic and Discovery One and that you can feel good about because it's smart if you don't if you haven't already made a bunch of shows of that nature even if you sell them the idea they won't let you make the show alone on your own the way you normally work. What they'll do is they'll pair you with a company. They'll give you two or three companies, maybe one of them would be mine, um, and have you go meet with them and, and sort of see how you connect with the production company. And the production company is not just providing a facility, they're helping you shape the show and sort of do the storytelling work that we always do, but it's these companies are big enough and have done enough work that the network is comfortable you know, having the money flow to that company and they're, they're trusting that um, the whole, all the insane stuff you don't want to have to deal with when you're making a TV show that I spend too much of each day dealing with, uh, you guys don't have to and that that stuff's going to be taken care of. Um, so, and, and by the way, partnering up with somebody is not a bad thing at all because it allows you to focus for your first series or two on helping make sure that the show is great and that it's uh, true to what you wanted it to be and you don't get bogged down in dealing with all the legal calls and all the stuff that follows. I, so my, my advice to someone uh, who wants to do what I do is to make tapes and to um, do stuff that uh, evidences that shows off your storytelling telling capability you recognize uh, a subject that's worth following um, or if it's a historical idea you want to produce you do the writing and the creative treatment and you really shape that in the smartest way possible if it's a present tense story about someone who you find compelling and that you think could be compelling across the course of 10 episodes of something then you make a tape and you make that tape uh, beautiful and smart and you don't need the great news these days is that you don't need a ton of equipment you don't need 50 people helping you to do that and I would say that most of the work we got in the first two to three years honestly especially at new networks networks we hadn't worked with before had nothing to do or didn't have wasn't necessarily the idea that we sold it was that we made a good tape that they loved and saw it as something different and they were impressed and so when something else came along they still remembered our tape and they'd give us a call or recommend that someone talk to us about a project and uh, it's uh, so making that tape and making it really smart and great and I'm talking about three to five minute reels just lovely simple beautiful smart um, that's sort of the best way to get into it um, I I had I, do, I probably don't even, I'm not even brave enough to try to show a clip of something um, given how the tech issues we had up front, but I was, Is it that case yeah. study, Max? Yeah, yeah, it, what, what it, it, it's it. a four to five minute reel. So, um, yeah. Right. And this is, let's see if it comes up. Um, this is, uh, I thought it was sort of an interesting idea because, or something interesting to show because it is an idea that was brought to me in a slightly different form than it ended up uh, being sold in by a woman who's just an amazing uh, newspaper reporter. She operated, she, over, she ran the night desk at the Daily News for years and years and she had learned over the many years she worked there that the crazy stuff happens at 3 o'clock in the morning and she had an idea for a series, a, a program that would be about the people doing this unusual work late at night. Well, we loved the idea and we went out with her and made a, I guess it's a four minute tape and you don't even have to show all, the entire thing because it may be a bit long, but it, it um, why don't you show it and uh, then I can talk about it briefly.
I'm not hearing audio. I don't know if you can. Contest winner who gets in is just so happy to be in a limo for the first time in their life. All the way up to the top end A-list celebrity. I never know what to expect. Hey, you my driver for tonight? That's me. I'm Justin Ross Lee, as if you didn't know. What's your name, baby? Brian, how you doing? Oh, you're a big boy. All right. My customers tonight are a bunch of fucking assholes. Brian, we got some alcohol, baby? Yes, you do. Whoa, oh, come on. I'm you. I've driven a lot of people around. This guy is definitely one of the worst. Do you know how hard it is to make a porn star cry? I get laid more than eggs. You interrupt me one more fucking time, I'm going to ask you to leave the limo. Everyone's heard what happened in Tijuana, okay? Hey, Brian, the limo driver, we've been in a limo for what? Ten minutes? Why are we not there? I've seen you outside the limo. you got a very heavy foot. It goes well with the rest of you. i got a very heavy fist, too. Someone is going to shut him up before the night is through, I'm sure. Really into a puddle? What do I look like? Do you see these shoes? If not, I'll do it. It's uh, one, two, three, four. Where are the horse? I'm Justin Ross Lake. We're going to be coming in. We have had five ships come in in the last 20 minutes. And tie it up, Kurt. Without a doubt, the most dangerous part of our job is the transfer to getting on or off a vessel. They get on and off ships in, in torrential downpours, in large swells, every day of the year. It can be very, very dangerous. I don't want any fear tonight. All right. That's my one goal for tonight. No fear no Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, back on. I just uh, very quickly will say that um, her idea was to make a program about people who did real jobs late at night. And there was a crime scene photographer coming up. And it was, we made this real not to sell any of these individuals as actual subjects in the show, but just almost like a mood board or a mood reel about you know, ideas about how we might shoot it and just the kind of verite docky feel uh, with a few interviews but not many. And we took that tape around and after, you know, four months of trying to sell it, Showtime bought it and we're in the middle of making that series but it has completely morphed into a sort of old-fashioned follow doc series about five or six people who live in New York. Some of them work late at night, some of them just hang out late at night. It's not a real housewives. Um, it's more, it's really beautifully shot. I think of it as, you know, what's the This American Life version of a follow doc where no one, there's no reporter and people aren't uh, being interviewed nonstop. And these people all have in common this one thing that there's potential in their personal lives and work lives for, for interesting stuff to happen at 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it's an idea that, you know, at first I felt like it was a more old-fashioned, traditional, not a reality show, but an old-fashioned doc series. We got Showtime interested, and I honestly felt like at a certain point it became a little more of a, uh, gosh, a titillating story late at night. 
and in terms of sort of the early conversations we had with them. And yet now I'm right where I want to be because it's, uh, it has the feel of a very authentic and real and beautifully shot film. So it's, uh, I feel like the, the, the stories, the people are appropriate to Showtime in that they're adults, but it's not a, it's not crazy stuff at all. It's just normal, you know, people dealing with their lives. They just happen to have stuff happening at three o'clock in the morning that happens to all of the rest of us uh, during daylight hours. All right, and um, maybe should we answer a few questions now? Yeah, um, the, the first question that seems to have come in was about control uh, for the filmmaker. Yep. Uh, yep. It says, with those partnerships with larger companies, how much creative control uh, does the filmmaker usually have? You know, it all depends. And some people come in, creators who have an idea, and they honestly don't want much control or they don't need that. They want to sell the idea and make sure they're involved at the very beginning and then step away a little bit. The two documentary filmmakers we worked with on the North Dakota story wanted to continue to make the, the TV series. So what we did is that we housed them in our office. This is how all the front lines work if we're not um, directing them ourselves. We housed them in our office. We paired them with a guy who we work with all the time who's sort of a director showrunner type who's done a lot of uh, uh, TV series of this nature and it was a really good partnership. Um, what happens in my world, and I don't know, I mean I know Frontline, but there, I may not know the rest of PBS as well, but what happens in my world is that the network always has the final say and um, so not even left right has the control as you might traditionally think of that phrase, but you actually in truth have enormous control and that is that we don't hide things from them, but we shape the story in the best way possible. We, we know what they want, but we want to make sure that the story is real and authentic and good and strong. And um, we, we, for one, I don't know about other companies, but if somebody is good at what they do, they have a great idea and they want to be involved, um, we make sure that they stay involved. And that's actually usually a, a positive for us. I've had one instance where someone very junior um, came up with an idea that we were able to partner with her on and sell uh, to a network and um, she wanted to work on the show. She was not experienced enough to be what in my world we call the showrunner. So she it was sort of an unusual situation where she be essentially became one of the producers on the project. She got an EP credit but there was someone day to day sort of the field general out there who was above her in the to, on the totem pole, and it actually got to be quite complicated. So that was a situation where too much control going to her might have hurt the show a little bit, um, though her role as an EP was quite important because she was great with the community we were filming in and good about story and talent. It was just the day-to-day -day, uh, details which she was getting better at. Um, so it's uh, it's not the control you would get, I would imagine, making a, making your own film and then trying to sell it to POV or some other uh, venue. So. And I, I see another question here that's essentially similar to that last question, uh, but it's a question about how would you go about trying to secure uh, a group of producers uh, for making a documentary or series idea when you yourself are just starting out? Like, what is the best? What are the best tools, I guess, to have? Yeah, um, I think on. I think it's two things simultaneously. One, it's get work someplace and find a good production company. Again, if you want to move in the world, I move in. Find a good production company. Uh, if you do well at any of these places. The goal for the business owners is to keep you fully employed all the time because it's so uh, hard to find great people. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully uh, if you find a good spot at the right company, you can grow with them and do more stuff. But secondly, at the same time, I would, you know, uh, I if you look at the 3 a.m. tape, the, the guy on the tugboat, he ended up, that story ended up not making it to the current version of the show, but maybe if someone had found that guy and, and 
really focus solely on the tugboats and that world and what it's about, you make a tape, um, and it can be a three-minute tape, and you get a, a production company and then a network interested in it. I, I think I, I, I just couldn't, can't underscore enough the importance of being able to demonstrate that these tapes because are, are, are good. And if you if you're able with a, you know, it requires a camera and it requires access to editing equipment and someone who knows how to do it. But if you can make something that's good, and I, I honestly, sometimes these days, the look of the tape may be a little less important. It could be you found the greatest character in the world and you just do a very simple interview follow uh, with the person. And if that person really is right for TV and you show that on tape and you have you have a you try to sign that person so you that person's connected to you then um, that's a great way to get your foot in the game that's a good point uh, that sort of ties into the the next question we have here um, actually first someone wanted to know if there's a distinction between creating your reel uh, for networks versus for a general audience. Uh, so I think she wants to know if she's making up distinctions there, but when you're creating your reel, who's your audience? That's a great question. I, you know, it's funny, and I think it hurt us. I thought the 3 a.m. reel would sell right away. And in fact, what happened is it, you know, you take that reel to a female skewing network and they'd say, ah, it's too male. You, some of the men, male skewing networks were thrown by the woman at the very top who was a female. And then more importantly on 3AM, some networks thought it was too risque, too wild. Like TLC, which is very middle America, um, loved this reel and they really wanted to do it, but it was just too much. It was too potentially too wild for them. And so on this, in this particular instance, I decided I'd make a one reel that I could show every network that I thought might be interested in the project. And I may have lost a little bit of something there because I may have made it too broad in a sense. Um, usually the first big question is, all right, is this an idea that really skews more female or male? And a lot of the like docu-soap work, if it's sort of a fun light look at a group of friends, oftentimes that women traditionally watch more of those those shows. If it's a true crime show and it has a bit, a lot of procedural stuff in it, women tr traditionally watch those short shows more often. So I think that's one thing you think about. You want to you wanna tailor it to the network executives rather than the audience at large. Um, and, and Trust that they can. Uh, okay, we lost you though for a second, Banks, yeah. but I think you're back on. Okay. Uh, there is another yeah. question here that sounds to be about really protecting yourself as you go out to find these production company collaborations. Uh, someone yeah. wants to know, how do you know if the production company will take you seriously or just not just take your idea and, and run with it by yeah. themselves? Yeah. You know, I I used to think about those same things. In my experience, I've never heard of um, a production company stealing an idea. I honestly haven't. If you are doing – now, production companies like mine are, have always uh, 100 different ideas they're talking about. So if you're talking about a concept, uh, you know, like uh, Dirty Jobs or Wife Swap, I guarantee you every version of that, those ideas has been talked about by almost every country, uh, company and network. So if you're coming in with just sort of a concept, a format, um, I think you're supposed to write it up and, and sort of prove uh, uh, you can sort of show that you originated the idea. But that's sort of meaningless because production companies are thinking about uh, the, those ideas all the time. If you have a sp uh, particular historical um, series or idea that you're interested in, um, then uh, writing that up and uh, you know being as detailed as you can would be helpful. I guess there's a risk that a network might that someone might steal a format or a historical angle or area, 
Um, much of what we do deal with when we're meeting with people, usually if it's a historical idea, it's a historian, a book writer, an author who brings us the idea. Um, and it can also oftentimes be literally based on a book, which makes it easy because there's no risk we're going to steal the book. Um, and then most often the ideas that come in are about real people, and those are tapes. And there's no way, if you particularly, if you have a personal relationship with the person you followed, and beyond that, I really would get a very simple uh, document that connects you to them for a period of time, like a shopping agreement or a talent hold agreement. Then you're totally protected because I can't go to um, that person and do a new deal with them. You're legally bound to them and they to you, so you're you're safe. I would say one thing I've seen happen with some production companies that you need to be really careful with is if you come in and you leave a tape, they won't. Sometimes what they they do is they they're not gonna steal the tape. They're not gonna uh, steal the idea and try to make the show without you. But what they will do. And I've heard of this. I've I obviously have never done it, but they will show. They'll have a meeting at a network when they're really friendly with the executive, and they'll show part of your tape. And they may not even say outright that they have a deal with you. They may say, "Oh, I had a great meeting with this young filmmaker the other day, and I'm really in love with this tape. What do you think?" And they'll show it. You do not want that to happen because. The first time a network sees a tape, it's really important, and you may not go with that production company. You may go with someone else, and if the next company you're with um, shows that tape to a network executive and they say, oh, I've seen this before, it's awful. So you want to share a tape, probably not leave it behind, or if you do, make super clear that you don't want it shown anywhere. To know. Uh, some of these upcoming questions sound like access questions. Uh, someone wants to know, you know, since most of these production companies don't really accept unsolicited material, uh, and yeah. it's hard to get in front of a TLC or a TBS, what, what's yeah. the best insight you have on how to do that? It's so hard. That is the hardest part. And uh, usually, um, you know, we, our approach is to I think it probably says on the website we don't accept unsolicited projects or pitches, but you can usually get through to us, and if, especially if you have a tape you want to show, um, sometimes we'll ask people to sign a document that protects us because the thing we're worried about is we're making, you know, we're coming up with some new idea at 3 a.m., and it's fairly close to what you're doing. We've been working on it for two years. Um, and it has nothing to do, of course, with your idea, but then you come in and pitch your idea, it's 4 a.m., and then we sell later 3 a.m., and you think we stole it from you. So that's why that document, uh, the agreement that we sometimes put in front of people and make them sign that sort of protects us. Um, but I, I, we usually, particularly if tape has been, been shot, then we will try to watch that, and if we like it, we'll... we'll will bring the person in and have a conversation with them. I like this, um, again, I, it's more of a commercial thing, but there's a New York television festival, and the guy who started that I know a little bit, and I've been really impressed with some of the tapes I've seen uh, from people who have submitted those tapes to that uh, film TV festival, um, so that if you know, people will make little reels to sell an, a nonfiction idea, and uh, they'll uh, be viewed at the festival, and the judges will pick some as the, the best tapes, and then uh, that helps uh, draw interest from television production companies. Some people have agents, and it's hard to get an agent until you've done enough work, so I, I wouldn't get too... Um, focused on that, but my belief is if particularly if you have a tape that's good and it's about a per, it's not just a format, it's about a person who might be good as a member of a nonfiction reality TV show, whatever it is, um, that tape will be seen. That's the easiest way to sell yourself. Good, good. Uh, and someone here wants to know about, and we can take maybe one or two more questions, guys. Uh, but this question is about uh, skill sets. Like, what is yeah. what are the most essential skill sets to surround yourself with as as you're starting out? And a question about you know division of labor and, and managing that team. Yeah. Um, God, that's a great question. 
Um, you want, obviously, to find people who are good at everything they're doing. Um, I honest, I find that we often look at an idea or a tape, a written idea or a tape, and even if we don't think it is an idea that can be sold to a commercial television network, we do admire the storytelling sensibility, and we'll want to work with that person. We'll want to see their other thing, other ideas they come up with, or we'll want to hire them to work on a show. Um, so more than anything, it's just making something small, you know, not enormous, not too long, but really beautiful and smart. Um, and that can be, you know, without a total like commercial TV, it's sort of a game. And I feel like when I'm interacting with a documentary friend who has an idea and he wants me to help develop it with him, part of my job, my, my job after I've sold something to a place like Showtime, like on a project like 3AM, is to make it as great as that network will let me make it and Showtime will let us do everything we want. So I feel like I'm sometimes with ideas, I'm adding the, the documentary DNA to it and making it smarter and better. Uh, other times I take an idea that's already smart and documentary in its DNA and I'm trying to make it more commercial and having the ability to not to really see the most commercial route uh, for a project is really important and a lot of that I think just comes with experience and finding the right company to help work with you and we're not the only company that would be a good partner in that regard because I, I think a lot of companies are looking for this kind of stuff. I I think that there was a lot in one of some of our early projects. I did a project after I left MTV before I started this company where it's the one time I had worked for another company and they had hired a bunch of reality TV people who had worked on dating shows and things like that. And it just wasn't the right group. And what we have found over the years is that hiring people who have more of a documentary background, even if it's they never thought they'd work in a more commercial uh, show, is often the best way to go because they know how to that make things real and not interfere too much. And when they do have to produce or direct, they do it in the with the super deft and light touch. Um, so I think it's uh, boiled down to one word. I think it's storytelling. And that can be visual operating the camera. It can be technical and doing the editing. It can be the producing. Um, and and with a sense that you're not, you don't want to pitch the most artistic uh, abstract idea to a network like TLC because uh, that's not what they're looking for. So you have to be careful about that. Hmm. Good point. Uh, we got two more questions here, and they're yeah. sort of about money. Um, someone wants to know what's the average production or show budget uh, for a reality TV show versus a more documentary-oriented uh, TV show. Ah, that's a great question. It's I think it's less the content, and maybe I mean I, generally speaking, uh, reality is almost <laughs> the cheapest form of TV in the eyes of the network executives, and that may be why it's going to be around for a long time. There's some shows that are extraordinarily inexpensive. Our most inexpensive show is, uh, you know, we make these ser the series of shows called Hawaii Life, and it's literally someone moving to from the mainland to Hawaii and looking at three or four different houses and picking one to buy, uh, working with the real estate company we partner with on the show. It's very simple. Um, it doesn't take a long time to make it, and it's just you know, it's probably five times, no, let's say three or four times less expensive than This American Life was. This American Life was a very expensive show. Um, they gave us all the tools. They gave us all the time. We were able to add TV people to the radio staff and uh, hire the best piece possible people at every job and, and take our time doing it. Um, so the range can be $150,000 for a half hour episode to 400 for a 300 to 400 for an hour long docu soap something like housewives i guess and then some shows and then you know probably we've done hours for 250 to 300,000 that are factual 
based shows. We did a project for National Geographic last year about the modern American mob, and that was uh, that was fun because it was, you know, you could see a version of that show being on PBS, but it was made, you know, five percent, five or ten percent more commercial for Nat Geo. Um, and then shows like This American Life, and we're starting to do some scripted stuff, can be, you know, over half a million um, per episode. Wow. So. Uh, we're starting to get our last two questions here, guys. Uh, sure, and sure. this one is sort of, I guess, personal. Uh, but someone wants to uh, know how much the bank was willing to give you uh, once you had that show commitment letter. Ah, you know, we, we did a we, – we had an accountant, and he, he – he was pretty good, and he has been, the greatest thing he gave to us was an introduction to this bank, and they were just fantastic. So what we did, I think we had a, a loan that we could access up to, I think it was $100,000 or maybe a little under $100,000, and it was sort of a, I've uh, forgotten what it's, it's like a financing instrument that was always in place. So we'd use it when we needed to to buy equipment and we would immediately, like a week later, start to pay that equipment, pay pay that loan down and off. So we never had much of it uh, that we had to owe um, back to them. We were able to, I think one thing, if you guys haven't thought about it yet, is that starting a production company is complicated business-wise, and there's a tendency to want to do it out of your house and keep it really small, and I think that works. But once you start hiring people and needing insurance and start to buy equipment, um, there are just lots of stories about companies that got overextended, they spent too much money too fast, and they never recovered. So we had we weren't the most sophisticated business people in the world, but we just kept everything really small and we're insanely careful about the money. Like we created, when we were working on two shows, we would create two separate bank accounts so the money would never mix and touch. And mm. we were just careful that way because uh, once you fall behind, or you, I just, I know really smart people who've had a hard time growing a business from a small, you know, independent single documentary film business structure to something where you're working on more than one project at one time. Cool. Very helpful. I would add one one last thing that the 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 downside to the more commercial work is that this American life accepted that you the time frame is just shorter than it is or than it was in my experience with PBS. Um, and that's hard. You know, people you gotta move fast and that can really wear you down. Um, and when we work on a front line, it's uh, it always feels like it's a, a bit rushed, but in truth, the schedule is so much, we have so much more time on those projects than we do on some of the other things we work on. Hmm. That's good to know. So, uh, and we have the last question here, uh, which is a pretty important one, uh, about the effect of platforms like Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon. How has that changed the yeah. game for, for producers? Yeah, they're like a... I think everything's going to change in five to six years, and uh, I think it's all going to head to you know people watching TV on their computer. Um, and right now, Hulu, Netflix, um, Amazon, even um, Xbox, that has sort of gone away, but we have a project with them that's still alive. Uh, they're almost like new buyers, so they're new networks, mm -hmm. and. We go to meetings with them and uh, we pitch them ideas. And I don't think they do as many projects, uh, though the projects they do are higher end. Um, I think the really interesting thing is that, you know, uh, uh, companies or websites like Maker are making lots. And, and that's an area where, boy, uh, I would, if I were starting over, I would do more of that work. I would. And Maker uh, is the Google Studio, right? Yeah, yeah, where you can, they're shorter form pieces, they don't, the budgets are not as high, um, but they, they're they so creative and you really get an opportunity, especially with comedy, to have fun and do really fascinating things. And that, those projects, the, the infrastructure demands are not as high, and uh, we, that's the one area where I feel like we're, we're we've not done as what, we've not focused on that as much as we should. Um, 
the right, I, I think it's the networks and the internet spots are going to get closer to each other and hmm. um, that probably means that the web stuff becomes more and more important and you know we can make the transition like doing the Xbox Xbox project is easy because it's a big enough project that it's like making a TV show for Showtime or History Channel um, but I think coming into the business to be able to do like there are all those interesting websites on science programming and getting some of those projects where you can come up with an idea and I bet those are easy to pitch and you don't have to go through as many layers, you don't have to partner up with another company, you just go in and pitch and if they like it then um, you're able to do the work right away and that, that'd be great. Cool. Thank you very much, Banks. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, today. That was a lot of very, very useful information. Um, Thank you guys for, for showing up. Apologies again for the delay, but if you could take a minute when you're done to just complete that survey that we just put up in the uh, window there, just uh, feel free to complete that whenever you want. Uh, it'll really help us improve these uh, webinars with the right topics and more people and really help you out uh, as you prepare your application for MBPC 360. Uh, thank you again, Banks Starver. For My pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Uh, and we will have the recording of this up on our website very soon for you guys to access and it'll be at blackpublicmedia.org thank you guys have a good evening bye bye, bye, -bye.